there we go. So um, right now the SCM is just uh, got nothing in it. Um, we're waiting for the samples to prep a little bit and um, there's a spider coating going on. We had a couple of samples that we tried to um, prep that are living material and as a result uh, I had them at home with me and brought them in this morning to let them dry and they just got a little bit of a late start. So the other samples are all in the carousel um, and we're ready to load them. And uh, I think as you can see, let's see, down there, um, I managed to fix the... Is it done? Yeah. Okay. So... don't have my normal collection of helpers today. So we're slightly less high tech. Um, these samples were collected just a couple of days ago uh, for Pacific Plankton Stream. And so she streamed this material, and then um, hot-footed it over to the post office and sent it to us. And I managed to wrestle it away from our university mail system uh, long enough and fast enough to actually prepare samples. So Mallory did that on Friday, and um, if you want to be on camera, you can sit on that side of me. I don't know. If you don't want to, you don't have to. Read the chat. Yeah, you can be in control of me over there. <laughs> uh, and we... Um, put it into nitric acid which is a, um, just our way of getting rid of all the organic matter, but I kept some of the samples separated that we didn't put into nitric acid. And for those, I just rinsed them to get rid of the salts, and I probably didn't get rid of all the salt. Um, but that actually allowed us to prep these samples as well. So, um, Showing a static image of uh, something that's not actually on the screen. I think it's because it's paused. Um, so let's see if I maybe move that over there. You can see Eleanor behind me. Hey, Sinai, how you doing? Uh, we have Yance and Pacific Plankton is here. I put a little. Uh, I put a little logo in the middle of the screen, which is a drawing that I did. And um, uh, because the samples were collected by Pacific Plankton and, um, and we're looking at basically her material, I thought it would be polite of me to advertise for her. You can check out Pacific Plankton's streams. She streams Plankton uh, live that she collects on Mondays and on Thursdays. And um, so she sometimes does a little afternoon uh, field trip, shows us collecting the actual samples, and then, um, you know, when the weather's nice, I guess, and she has time. And then uh, on 
the evenings of those same days, usually starting around midnight or one in the morning, Eastern time. Um, then she does a little late night stream of the actual plankton. And um, I like it when we do crossover episodes where you get a little bit of what I do mixed together with a little bit of what somebody else does. So um, we did this before with Pacific Plankton's material and, um, and I thought it went rather nice. Um, so we have some of that material here today and hopefully uh, will also turn out equally good. So um, the slight delay in our start um, for what's actually on the screen but uh, I think we got it under control now so ah, there we go and let's see let me make sure that that's oh it's not showing you what's on my screen for some reason I need to fix that let's see the only thing I need to do. Uh, is the mic quieter? I can turn up the mic a little bit. Hopefully that helps. It's a, uh, you know, it's a little quieter when it's, uh, when it's me and one other person than when we have the whole gang here. So let's see, I want to make sure that that's actually updating. Yeah, okay. So um, let's see, we've got a ton of material on here. And um, this is just the, the sample that's in uh, the seventh slot, the middle slot on our SEM. But uh, it's actually set up with several slides full of this. And I actually want to start because I'm kind of curious what the, um, what the non-processed material looks like. So I have two stubs that just have non-processed material. That's these ones. And um, you can see one of the things that's cool about that is that we can actually see some of the living uh, organisms. They look a little bit like somebody sucked all the air out of them. So here's an example of one of those. Uh, we can see some, uh, some of the zooplankton and it looks like somebody's pulled all the air out of this poor little thing. Uh, but actually gives you a little bit of insight into other things that are in the samples. So, um, you know, it's nice when we look at the diatoms, but when we process things, it actually uh, creates some issues uh, where things were, were normal in, in their living positions have been uh, modified. So, for example, we have these nice chains of Catoceros and, um, and these living organisms that, uh, well, they were alive, they're, they're dead now, but uh, and, and some things are actually in their life position. So it's kind of neat to be able to kind of bounce back and forth between um, what is, uh, you know, processed material where we've actually gotten rid of all the organic matter and stuff, news, stuff where there is unprocessed. So we got a new follower. I can't we read We got it. good feedback from a T Torp. Absolutely T -torp. awesome stream. I love phytoplankton. Well, you're, you've come to the right place. Um, we, we show a little phytoplankton now and then. Uh, actually, the marine diatoms and marine plankton are not my specialization. Um, I've, I've gradually been training myself to learn to identify them. Uh, but uh, I'm actually a freshwater diatomist, and so I'm much more familiar with the freshwater uh, plankton than I am the marine stuff. But um, I'm willing to uh, showcase some of the cool things that um, other people see. I have no idea what that is. It's a baffling object. Uh, we might get a fair amount of that uh, where I don't know what something is. And I'm totally okay with that if you're okay with that. Um, but uh, when it comes to the diatoms, most of them I'm pretty good with. So, uh, you know, even though they're marine stuff, um, if we were to sneak freshwater stuff on here, I'd be a lot better at it. Uh, but um, we're not actually even close to the capacity for this instrument at the moment. I'm still just sort of warming it up. And um, what I mean by that is that uh, we're not even at the right height. So uh, 
or not even close to the right heights. Now that I can actually see into the chamber, which I fixed the camera which is down there in the corner, uh, I can do this without worrying that I'm going to smash my machine to bits, and then I can get a little bit closer as a result. Uh, we're going to do that now. Um, let's jump up to five millimeters. And, uh, and now our magnification is actually enhanced quite a bit. And um, our ability to focus on some of the details of some of these tiny things has also been ramped up in the process. And um, the, it's like anything else, the closer you get to it, the more you can magnify it easily. But also a consequence of that is that we lose a little bit of depth of the field. So um, we can't have everything in focus all at the same time. If we're mostly focusing on looking at little things, then uh, it doesn't really matter that much. So it's sometimes beneficial for us to, to give those a poke. Uh, one of the things that you can see here, this is a giant diatom that's common in benthic material um, rather than in the plankton. Sometimes benthic material gets um, sort of picked up from underneath uh, by wave current activity and uh, that actually causes it to be temporarily suspended so these big diatoms are actually not part of the plankton, they're actually part of the benthic, the benthic component. And they've got a whole bunch of little passengers on them, which I think is kind of cool. Um, these are, uh, the little guys that are on here are diatoms, and the big guy is a diatom. So uh, they're getting like a piggyback ride. And you see that's actually quite common with uh, Ismia, which is what this, um, this diatom is. Uh, where it's so huge, so you can see other organisms in the background, like these are diatoms, these little round things are all diatoms, that's a diatom, and this is also a diatom. And diatoms are a single-celled algae, they're golden brown algae, uh, which means that they have chloroplasts, and, um, and they have to live in the sunlight for the most part. And um, so they, even though they live on the bottom of the ocean, they have to live in relatively shallow water where the sun actually gets to the bottom or else they wouldn't be able to live there. Um, but they also then become part of the substrate. And that means that anything else that needs a surface to live on can colonize them. And if you're big enough, diatoms will grow on you, even, uh, even if you're a diatom. And then Micah is... wants to know if you've ever gotten samples from the Great Lakes. Uh, you know, I've never looked at material from the Great Lakes um, on the SEM, but we do have uh, somewhere in the lab probably some materials from uh, Lake Michigan um, and maybe some from Lake Superior. Good news, everyone! Oh, we got a new follow. Hmm. And um, so, but you you could uh, very easily get that material. And I have colleagues that work in one the Great Lakes. One has followed. All right, thanks for the follow. Um, I very easily could get some material from the Great Lakes. One of my colleagues, uh, another diatomist named Ewan Reavy, works on the Great Lakes. And um, you know, he, I don't think he follows me on Twitch, but we're friends on uh, Facebook and Twitter. And I suppose if we, if there was somebody who really wanted to see some Good great, news, great everyone. material from the Great Lakes, um, I bet I could ask him for some. He's he's probably got some stuff that he'd like to see on the scanning electron microscope. See, Sketcher has joined the Diatom Army. All right, thanks, Sketcher. Thanks for the follow. And then little Chook wants to know how you're doing. Little Chook is here. Hi, little Chook. How you doing? And we Dirty Smith is here as well. All right. Hi, Dirty Smith. Some of our regulars are returning. A little Chook, can you give a shout out to Little Chook? It's just an uh, uh, exclamation point and then S O. S O. And then hit a uh, space. <laughs> and then at. Oh, wait, somebody beat you to it. Okay. So if you were going to do that, for example, for Dirty Smith, ah. you can just click on it so it says that. And mm -hmm. then when you hit enter or return or the chat button, I guess. There we go. And then it'll spell it out for people. Um, so we got some more follows while I was screwing around trying to help you with that. Um, so really one of the things I wanted to look for in the living material uh, that we saw a bunch of um, in uh, Pacific Plankton Stream were some dinoflagellates. And that's because the last time uh, that 
she sent me material, I didn't really see any dinoflagellates, and we've been seeing a lot in her plankton streams. And so I thought, oh, well, maybe if I uh, slap some on here and I don't process it, we'll be able to see some of the dinoflagellates. Because I'm afraid that if we uh, put it into nitric acid, one of the things that's going to get dissolved in that scenario is, uh, is the uh, dinoflagellates. So um, these things here that you're seeing are uh, little tintinids, and they make their homes by agglutinating material onto the outside of, uh, you know, their, their bodies and creating a little um, home for themselves out of it. And I'm going to try to touch up the settings just a little bit on everything as we go. Uh, one of the things is you'll note that the image quality looks a little grainy sometimes, and that's because on a scanning electron microscope, I can kind of control the image quality based on how fast the beam is scanning across the material. If it scans very quickly, then we get our image moves very, very quickly. So like a video, if we were moving from one place to another, we need to actually speed the beam up. Um, if we slow it down, then we get much higher resolution images. So uh, what you're seeing usually as I'm moving around is uh, worst case scenarios rather than best case scenarios. So when we look at something and I can tweak the focus, um, you're still seeing a not great image, believe it or not, uh, even though we're looking at something that is only, you know, maybe 20 or 30 microns in size, um, the image quality can be improved quite a bit by me slowing down the beam. And I just haven't done that because I'm uh, still looking around for things. Uh, if I find something cool and I want to take a picture, then uh, we can definitely slow the beam down and get a nice clean image of it. I suspect that this is actually uh, a death balloon. I don't think that's a diatom. I think that is one of the Noctilucta. And I think that the Noctilucta have a, a little furrow that runs around the outside. Uh, I don't see the like normal skeletal material. And I think maybe that's, uh, that's because it's one of those things. Uh, so some, sometimes the round things that we'll be seeing will not be diatoms. Just keep that in mind. Um, also, some of the things that are, are not round are also still diatoms. So this right here is a detillum, for example. It's in its life position. And you can see the girdle bands have all sort of been crushed when it dried. Uh, but it's got, it sort of looks like a marshmallow on a stick or whatever. Uh, and it's shaped in a triangle. We sometimes say they look like a, a Toblerone or something, like a triangle prism, right? And then it's got these really cool little eyelash-like structures around the outside, which are um, actually spines. And then it's got a process that sticks up here through the middle. So that's actually, uh, I think it's a, a, a process associated with the rim of Portula on the inside of the bowel face. So we haven't seen very many from the inside. Um, it's kind of hard to get an internal view of, the, um, of those because of, their, um, because of their shape with that long spine. So it's kind of hard to see inside what's going on. So there's going to be a lot of just kind of random uh, uh, bits and pieces of things. Is um, Pacific Plankton telling us about what any of these things are? Uh, she wrote bivalve. Oh, did I pass by a bivalve? Um, there might be some bivalves in here as well. And then dangling uvulas here too. Hi, dangling. How are you doing? And Mallory is just talking about how she wants the emotes. What emotes? <laughs> she said something with the cat one. Oh, the ones that uh, other people have made. Yeah. And then five catchers said enjoying your stream. Do diatoms and bacteria coexist or one overtakes the other? So bacteria um, are are on the uh, typically in a different um, part of the sort of environmental chain. Bacteria are decomposers and diatoms are producers. And um, most bacteria don't like to be in oxygen-rich environments. And so they, they tend to do a little bit better when, you know, when things are um, anoxic. And uh, they will use the organisms to, when they, when they die, they will decompose the organic matter and remineralize it. 
And um, my answer to that is they, um, they don't really fight with each other so much as uh, diatoms live and grow. And then when they die, they're decomposed by bacteria. And it's actually a really important process for the diatoms to have that material decompose because it means that the um, phosphorus and nitrogen, which are in, usually in really limited supplies in aquatic ecosystems, can be remineralized, which means it goes from being in a body back into something that organisms can eat or consume to grow again. So if you didn't have that um, connection, that sort of ties the, uh, the remineralization process um, in those ecosystems. Every time a diatom grew and died, or any organism died, then the nutrients would be basically um, sequestered or stored away with, with their bodies. And um, it's really critical for, especially environments like the ocean where nutrients are scarce, to have access to more nutrients. And so the, the bacteria create a really critical pathway for, um, for that material to make it back up into the, the water. And it's part of the process by which, um, where you have upwelling, in, in both uh, oceans and in lakes where nutrients comes back to the surface, those nutrients are being uh, supplied essentially by bacteria that are decomposing um, living material. And then Pacific plankton said it's Actinopithecus. Actinopithecus, yes. Yes, Actinopithecus. And also here's a nice uh, view of the Catastrophe in its life position. So uh, they have these uh, long, it's actually an extension of their of their valve, of their uh, skeleton. They're kind of hollow. And we saw some of these with chloroplasts from inside of the cell that they extend out into these long, skinny uh, uh, setae, the things that are basically around the sides. And they also use to tie the valves together. So this is actually, this is one diatom cell, and this is the next, and this is the next, and this is the next. So between each cell, and its neighbor is this sort of like little hollow chamber. So that's how you can circle one whole diatom. And then they're, they're connected like siblings uh, to each other in these long colonies. This is Catoceros. Um, Pacific Plankton wants to know if you can take a photo. Of this? Yeah, I think so. Well, of course I can. And Tropical Geek's here now. Hi, Tropical Geek. Let me actually zoom in a little bit and get the image quality the way that I want it. So I need to tweak some things to do that. One is the focus. So I'm playing with the focus knob right now. And then the next is, normally um, I would check the wobble. So this is the beam wobble. And our beam is actually moving quite a bit. You can see the uh, thing kind of going back and forth. And our objective is for that to not move at all, or rather to just pulse. So if I put my mouse over this thing, I want it to just sit where it is. It's gotten a little bit of an up-down component to it right now. It's pretty close. And that will actually improve our picture. Oh my gosh, Mallory has bangs now. I heard that she had <laughs> put bangs on herself. And um, it's Mallory, so I'm sure that it is both impressive and also she's gonna hate it in a day or two. <laughs> And then we're going to have to live with her uh, indecision about her decision after she's made it. Okay. But so. dangling people, though, she spelled my name correctly. It's pretty impressive. Really? Yeah, it's pretty hard to get it right. Well, you have a normal name, but you have it <laughs> but spelled in a very weird spelling. Yeah. What, I mean, I actually, my name is similar, so uh, in the sense that it's a pretty normal name, Jeffrey. And uh, I have a unusual spelling of it. So people usually get the spelling wrong. Uh, okay, so let's, I'm gonna show you what I mean by how the image quality will improve. So you can see this line right here is actually the scanning of the beam. And so it's gonna improve the quality of the image as it goes. I'm gonna touch up the uh, the brightness and contrast settings so we get a nice clear image. And I've already messed with the focus and the stigmation. 
and the wobble, which are the primary things that we would usually mess with to try to make our image a little bit cleaner. This, sometimes <laughs> you have to be patient with it. What's going on? Uh, Triple Geek Geek wants to know why it's spelled wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Capsman is here too. Who's here? Uh, Capsman. Capsman? I, I don't know who that is. Capsman. <laughs> I guess there's a Capsman here. Okay. Hi, Capsman. All right, so... Uh, oh, I think they're saying that Tropical Geek always yells in the chat. Oh, yeah, like, yeah. All caps. Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, all caps. Yeah, okay. Oh, okay. We don't know if uh, Tropical Geek is a man or a woman, so you should say caps person. Okay. Uh, Tropical Geek says... I am tropical, I am loud, in caps. <laughs> okay. No argument from us. Let's see, San Francisco Bay. And I'm gonna just make a separate folder for these. See, Mika says that's such a strange looking organism. It looks like one of those aliens that would pierce you and then eat you. I mean, if it were big enough and you were food, it'd probably consider it. But in this case, those spines are largely meant to do a couple of things. One, they give a little bit more surface area so the diatom can have its um, chloroplasts uh, exposed much more long uh, area, across a much wider area. And then also they help hold the organism together in this chain. And then additionally, uh, they make it bigger and the colonies make it bigger, which means it's a little bit harder for it to be eaten. So it's kind of the opposite. Uh, it's making itself big and scary and spiny, mostly so you don't eat it. And Pacific Plankton says it eats sunlight. Yeah, so. sunlight and carbon dioxide. Yeah. And, uh, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> Everyone to know why Mallory isn't in the lab. <laughs> Mallory had a birthday party to go to for her aunt or something. Yeah. A great aunt, maybe. And, uh, you know, it's a weekend, so students are allowed to do whatever they want. Don't judge her. Plus, she had to get bangs. <laughs> it's really critical that we could see her forehead in all of its splendor by... <laughs> bangs. Do you think it's going to make her forehead look smaller? I always thought her forehead was normal sized, but... <laughs> I think her, her forehead's normal size too, but she's got a, uh, you know, she's concerned about it all the time, so I always have to make fun of it. So Mallory said it was her grandma, and apparently it isn't happening. Oh, you went home for nothing. Well, you know what? I saved the tardy, tardy grades uh, for, <laughs> for Wednesday's stream. So, um, <laughs> what's so funny? Um, Dirty Smith just said, speaking of her forehead, did she recover from that hit on yeah. the last stream? I don't know. You know, <laughs> she hits her head quite a lot, and even on the streams quite a lot. She's, one time she banged her head on this uh, desk from the SEM really hard, like loud enough that you could hear it on the stream. So, Good news, everyone. hey, we got hey. a new follow. This is SFB6. Pincer Cat. Hey, Pincer Cat. Thanks for the follow. We're going to, right now, we're looking at some material from San Francisco Bay, from the phytoplankton of San Francisco Bay. Um, that were samples that were collected by Pacific Plankton, and you could follow Pacific Plankton. If one of my mods could give a shout out to Pacific Plankton, and maybe to all of our microscope streaming friends, um, by using the uh, explanation squad. Exclamation point squad. Squad. Gotta learn how to spell it though. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, let's see. This is Ketoceros. Oh. And I'm going to browse around a little bit more. Uh, like I said, I wanted to kind of focus on not diatoms, but 
sometimes when we see them in their life position, it's kind of neat and it's worth stopping and take a look at them. Um, I really wanted to see some of these, uh, maybe some of the dinoflagellates as well. Uh, there's a bunch of sort of squished down stuff on this on here, this organic matter, uh, a whole bunch of squished down organic matter. Um, these are detilum, a type of diatom, and uh, this is a, I believe, a copepod that we're looking at. Uh, it looks like a copepod trash bag that somebody has pulled all the air out of the copepod with. Um, but I think that's antenna, and I think you're seeing its body right here. Uh, you can see they have sort of a torpedo shape to their body, and uh, they look a lot less impressive when you pull all of the air out of them. Uh, but they are predators that live in the system, and they eat all these other things. If they'll fit in their mouth, they'll eat them, as a general rule. Good news, everyone! Hey. Got some more follows. Here's another tintinid. This one's kind of propped open so we can see into it a little. Brain has joined our Diatom army. All right. Thanks for the follow. Boom. What, their name is Brain? I think so. Just Brain? Yeah. Cool. Okay. I'm going to zoom out a little bit. I'm going to see if I can find something interesting in the live material on this slide. And I'm going to carefully scan around. Tintinids, diatoms. You can see a lot of the composition of the phytoplankton is dominated by diatoms. Some catosterous, some of these really large uh, diatoms in here, but not sure what that is. Used to be living at some point. Oh, I see. Uh, there's an outline here. <laughs> this is what happens when you're looking at things in uh, in the SEM. The, the living material is turned into just the, like the police have drawn an outline around the body, right? So um, maybe that's a Anopleus, a little baby copepod. Here's a sponge spicule. Um, this is a detilum with the the uh, valve face pointed towards us. This is really sort of cool. Here's a diatom that's landed on its edge, right on the slide, I believe. So you can see it from the end on viewpoint. It's like you flipped a quarter and it landed instead of heads or tails, it landed on its side, <laughs> uh, on, the, on the coin edge. And you get a really good view of this. It's a Thalassiosyra. And this thing that's sticking out of the diatom is the external tube of the rimiportula, which is a structure that diatoms have on their um, skeleton. So this is the single-celled skeletal wall of the Lassiosyra. And the Lassiosyra always have this sort of um, characteristic structures on their valve. One of them is a rimiportula like this that stands up really high, and the other is a whole series of mantophotoportula, which are these little things we can see around the outside edge here. Uh, little dots here, our mantle photoportula, and that is the rimiportula. It's got junk on it, uh, a little organic junk all covering over it. But um, it's kind of neat that you can actually see it standing up. And in fact, if you look really carefully in the background, you can see there's a rimiportula on the top valve and one on the bottom valve, and there's the rimiportula on the top valve standing up on its own. And it's helping probably keep the, the coin on its edge because uh, it looks like it landed in such a way that it's balanced on that spine. And this diatom here is actually um, also Thalassiosyra, and that right there, so these are the little um, mantophotoportula around the outside edge, and that right there, that little barely focused um, at the moment spine-like thing sticking out, is that same structure that we saw sort of poking out of the valve face on the other one. It's broken a little bit, but this is the rimiportula structure that we saw when we were looking at it from the side. 
So if I put both of those in the field of view, let's see, like this, that structure right there is that structure right there. That's a really cool view because you can see the three-dimensionality of the diatom and you can see how this is the way it would look in its valve view and that's the way that it looks in the girdle view or the side view. Five catcher wants to know if they all have different color membranes based off of our Instagram page. I guess it's super oh, vibrant. The colors associated with the Instagram page are just Photoshop um, colors. So um, diatoms are made out of silica and in the scanning electron microscope, everything is black and white because um, there's no color. This is Astrolampulus, and it's actually a little diatom that I drew a picture of. That's my sketch that we're looking at in the uh, blue area in the middle um, above Pacific Plankton's name, and this is that diatom, the same diatom. This is uh, an external view of it, and I have an internal view of it that I drew, uh, but this is from the living material. And you can see that um, one of the things that's really neat about the scanning electron microscope is if we, if we, you know, we lose fact, we lose uh, sight of the fact that what we're looking at is super, super tiny, right? Because we're, um, you know, we're seeing it in its uh, sort of massive size. This is a 20 micron scale bar at the bottom. And there are 1000 microns in one millimeter and the entire field of view here that we're seeing from one side to the other to the screen is 82 microns. And if I were to zoom out to the maximum dimensions on the scanning electron microscope, right now where we are at a height of five millimeters away from the sample, the entire field of view is two millimeters. So that is the smallest tick on a uh, a, a ruler that has metric on one side would be about half of our screen. And what's neat about the scanning electron microscope is that it really gives you a sense of scale. So as we zoom in and we're looking at this thing, you think, oh, that's cool. It's, you know, got this little diatom, it's, it's tiny. But um, one of the things that really makes the scanning electron kind of uh, impressive to me is that we can keep going. And um, that dimension that we were looking at where we were seeing it um, in terms of, uh, you know, in millimeters, we are now looking at an entire field of view that's only nine microns across. And you can start to see the intricate structures associated with the valve face of these diatoms is really sort of interesting. And I can tweak the beam intensity, and then we can just keep going uh, a little bit here. And then. Redrum Lamb wants to know where the banana is for scale. <laughs> the banana? Yeah. We don't have a banana for scale? <laughs> uh, we don't have a banana at all, really. Uh, but I think you can see that these little dots <laughs> that are here, uh, we're down in the range. Right now we're looking at a, a, a picture. If I were to slow that down, um, we're looking at a picture where the magnification is actually 87,000 times. So a normal light microscope at its maximum usually sees something at around uh, 1,000x. And this is 87 times as powerful as that, our view right now. So these little tiny structures that you can see on the surface of this Astrolampholus, and if I zoom out, you see that they actually create a pattern. And, um, and I can just keep zooming out you can see that those patterns fit together into um, little areoli and that that actually connects together to these weird processes on the valve face and then if i keep zooming out then you can see the whole cell of the organism so kind of cool yeah, dirty smith says that's a small banana uh yeah it's a pretty small banana and this is a sponge pickle Geek says we should use pancakes instead of bananas uh, i mean i think that's fair uh it is uh I had waffles for breakfast, so, you know, I'm on board with it. And then Pacific Plankton wants to know if that's the outside. That's the outside view of the, of the Astrolampolis, yeah. And here's an Actinopticus. So an Actinopticus looks like a little radiation symbol. You can see the external view of the Actinopticus, and it's got little tiny openings here on the ends. This is the Rima portula. It's that same structure that we were seeing as like a little 
spine sticking out of the thalassiosira. It's also on only on the positive elevations. So there's a positive and a negative. So you can see the surface is basically um, oscillates from high to low like a radiation symbol. And the, um, the little holes or openings here, the rim of portula, only occur on the, on the uh, upward deflected elevations on that symbol or that, that shape, right? So here's one, here's one, and here's one over here. Um, if we were to look at the other valve, if we were to flip it over, it would have the opposite um, dimensions where the positives on this would be negatives on this, and then it would have holes associated with those positives on that valve. And Top of the points to know if there's any biological reason for the indentions of the radiation symbol thing. Yeah, I don't know why. Uh, some things diatoms do, there's not really a good explanation for, for anybody knows. I mean, it happens on such a small scale, it's really challenging for us to have any idea, you know, the why of why it's doing it. Here's an astrolomphalus. This one's on its side. Again, like the other one, this is like a coin that's landed on its edge. So you can really see that the surface of these things is highly undulate. And um, these are those little sort of tube endings that are associated with Rima portula on the inside of Astrolomphalus. So one of these rays coming off of them is a little bit longer than the other. And then the symmetry is actually along that uh, central line. The Mika said the radiation symbol pattern was to scare off predators. <laughs> yeah. And Chocolate Warning. Geek says it's just sorcery. Yeah, it could be sorcery. Um, <laughs> it's totally feasible. And then Bass Arpeggio says that's beautiful. A lot of these are really beautiful. And, um, you know, unfortunately, the things that some of the other plankton that are here, um, you know, all we have left are little husks of their bodies. But they're also quite beautiful when they're in their um, full life positions. Um, we just can't look at the um, those things as readily uh, because they, uh, like these little tintinids or whatever, they basically just um, sort of collapse under the pressure, the absence of pressure, I should say. Um, you know, somebody lets all the air out of the room and, uh, and sucks all the air out of their bodies. They were probably dead. Oh, here's one. There's a little pacifier. Uh, that's what I call these looking things. I think that's a tintinid. It looks like a little baby pacifier, right? Uh, Pacific Plankton probably knows what they're actually called. I think they're just a, a type of tintinid, like the ones that we saw that look like a light bulb. And again, I think they make their skeleton. Uh, yeah, she said, yep, tintinid. Tintinid, yeah. The Tropical Geek says that you can publish a book with all your diatom pictures and make money. Well, you know, um, I'm really not into making money. Um, I'm a little weird that way. Uh, in the good news, everyone. Oh. Hey. Uh, I'd like to just share my stuff with people. That's why I just post it onto Instagram and whatever else. Hey, um, Besser Pigio has joined the Diatom Army. All right, thanks for the follow. Um, uh, Tropical Geek says money for research. Well, so any money that we get from this stream from subs, for example, um, we use to put back into student research. So I just take the check and I dump it right back into our lab. And also I've created our Redbubble site. So if you just go to Redbubble and you uh, search under Diatom's Attack, you'll see that there's drawings similar to the one that's in the middle of the screen. And I think we're gonna donate that money also to student research. So if we make money um, from selling whatever products that are on there, I think we'll probably use that to uh, to put back into student research as well. So, okay. if you Red want. Drum Lamb said it's a plankton dressed as a ghost for Halloween, the <laughs> structure that looks like a pacifier. <laughs> it, uh, yep, it does look like a little ghosty costume. Uh, Bass Arpeggio said, we earned a follow for the large vocabulary we use here. Yeah, sorry about my vocabulary. Sometimes I forget who I'm talking to. Um, but also I feel like it's important that you know, like there's Good not, news, everyone. there's another follow. It's, it's very challenging to try to describe something that only has science terms to people who are not scientists. And so when I show you something and I say, that's a Rima portula, uh, I'm afraid there's not any other words for Rima portula except for labiate process, which doesn't sound any better, right? So Good it's news, like everyone. technical word and another technical word. 
what are all these Red follows? Drumlin has joined our Dietology, all right. as well as GAC75. All right, thanks for the follows. You can see the um, these uh, tintinids that shaped like Christmas light bulbs a little bit. Um, you can see that they're sort of hollow inside, and the organism lives inside that hole normally. And you can also see that they make their skeleton out of bits and pieces of whatever's in their environment. And sometimes you will find pieces of diatoms like this, or maybe just pieces of calcium carbonate from the bottom of the ocean. Um, and sometimes we've actually seen whole diatoms that they've incorporated into their skeletons when they have, when they have a small enough diatom that they can actually bejewel their house in them. Got another follow? Yeah, Scrap Rap has joined our diatom army. All right, thanks for that follow. And um, you can see there's a whole bunch of diatoms in here too. I think these are the Lichmorpha, Lich, Lichmophora, sorry, a uh, diatom called Lichmophora. And um, you can see they've got this sort of like wedge shape. That's the diatom, I think, probably in girdle view, yep. So uh, the one valve is here and the other valve is here. That is the whole diatom right there, one whole diatom. You can see one whole diatom in the background right here. And the valve face of these, I can probably zoom in a little. Yeah, you can see right here, uh, they have a raphe, uh, but they, um, they live in these sort of colonies attached by their foot pole, which is the skinny end of the diatom in this case. And usually that's the foot pole, um, called that because that's what they use to attach to a substrate. So you can see a whole bunch of these all attached by their substrate, uh, all attached to this substrate, whatever this mass is. And each one of those is a diatom growing uh, in this large colony. Then Pacific Plankton said head pole. Head pole is the other end, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you can get a sense of the foot pole and the head pole. We turn them into, we anthropomorphize them. We turn them into people so that uh, they make sense to us, right? The foot pole is the part that you attach to the... To I have the... to agree, they do look like diatom candy corns. <laughs> candy corn. <laughs> I like the uh, Halloween theme we got going on. We should stick with it. Uh, one other thing I'd like to note about this sample is I took it home to, to make some slides from, um, from the material. And uh, I happened to just open it, take a little bit out, put on a, a slide. And after a day of not being refrigerated and not being in the ocean, it stinks really badly. So uh, it does not smell great. Um, even after I rinsed it, I was kind of like, whew, it's, it's ripe. And then Vassar Pigeo gave you a compliment. He said you're doing a great job with the descriptions. If, uh, if I make something sound like food or someone else does, that's because I relate to food the best. So uh, if you're out there and you're thinking, why does he keep using food analogies? Well, <laughs> um, it might be because I haven't had lunch yet. And Avi Bro said we have you two have the most calming voices. <laughs> and then he sent a heart. <laughs> Aw, well, thank you. Um, this is my radio voice. You know, <laughs> my normal voice is uh, just screechy. Nobody can bear to stand it. Um, but when I get on the radio, I just turn on the golden voice. Um, so this is a, one of the zooplankton in, uh, in the sample. You can see that it's been uh, dehydrated and also something happened what was um, that noise diamond with a hundred. Oh, a cheer okay. thank you for the cheer I um, we don't get cheers very often so that's a, a rare rare noise for me good news everyone not to follow um, you can see the uh, the sort of structure to these things uh, maybe Pacific plankton can figure out what this organism used to be if she's still here Sarakari has joined our diatom army can you figure out what that organism is, Pacific Plankton, based on the shape? And then Vasaprigo said, since this is an electron microscope, does the subject matter still have to be coated in a metallic substrate? Yep. Everything in the sample that we're looking at has been coated in gold. Um, we have a gold sputter coater. We could also use silver, but um, the gold one was already in there, so we just used the gold one. And actually, it's a little bit better uh, for the quality of the image, slightly. Um, but uh, yes, everything has to be coated in metal, um, just like any scanning electron microscope, um, unless you're looking at metal or you're looking at something that doesn't uh, that carries a charge pretty easily. 
So um, you can see some diatoms stuck on the outside of it. That is a rhizoselenia, and that one is a thalassiosyra. And whatever this thing is, has Pacific Plankton given us any idea what she thinks this thing is? Or is she not in the channel? She maybe. Uh, she said, no, I need to think about that one. It's got really cool little uh, hairy things coming off of it. And the Mallory one pointed out, nobody has said anything about calming voices when she's on here. Yeah, I know. That's so weird. <laughs> that is weird, Mallory, because your voice is like angels singing. Tropical Geek says it's too high pitched. <laughs> uh, Tropical Geek, you need to take your beef with Mallory outside. <laughs> this looks like some sort of weird organ, like a, like a news, Phantom of the Opera would play, like a weird <laughs> beastie organ. I think it kind of looks like a heart, like, you know, all the, the veiny things that go into it. You mean veins? Yes. <laughs> this is why I study rocks. <laughs> <laughs> Those veiny things that go into the heart. Oh, yeah, that's what they Pacific are. Pacific Plankton said barnacle malts, maybe. Yeah, maybe it's a barnacle. I, I could agree with that. Uh, it definitely has, like, a barnacle-y look to it. Uh... So, in the rare case where we're taking a picture, I can actually see what's going on in the channel. Crime scene photo, yeah. Yeah. Top of the week only trolls her because I heart her. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Underneath the mask, there's a synthesizer, and uh, it's oh. what you're hearing is like, um, you know, it's like a T pain filter, except for what comes out is just golden. And on the other side of it, it's just like screechy. I won't reveal my secret uh, voice synthesizer. And then somebody said, I in before ban. I don't know what that means. In before. Uh. In before they, they ban. Somebody got banned. You need to work on your, uh, like, gamer lingo. Yeah. 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 We're just taking a picture of this because I think it looks cool. Sometimes I do that. Uh, I have no idea what it is. Probably a barnacle. Um, based on all the little frills around it. And then Top of Geek wants to know who got banned, but I don't think anybody did. Nobody. Yeah, nobody did. <laughs> Unless Mallory banned somebody while we weren't looking. I don't think so. Uh, Vesaprego. Tendrils. Tendrils. Yeah, they're like little tendrils. Uh, I don't know what they're called. Uh, they're little hairs on a barnacle, I think. Uh, I don't know what they're called, though. We need Pacific Plankton to give us the scientific lingo for organisms that are sm uh, larger than or more multicellular than diatoms. So... These are, uh, these are always the bad guy in my stories. You know, they're the thing that eats me uh, as a person who studies diatoms. See, Jan's kind of stirring up. She said maybe if we bully Igor enough, some heads might roll. Oh, I see. <laughs> Jan's is a boy. Okay. And Mallory says, nah, I got six feet deep skin. I don't know if that's true. Yeah. I think Mallory's oh. pretty sensitive. Now we know Tropical Geek is six feet tall. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, that's what he said. I'm just going to label this one a uh, creepy organ. It's like the Halloween edition. You know, we are going to have a Halloween edition uh, at some point here. It gets, I guess it's going to have to happen next week, right? We're gonna we're gonna have to uh, do a day where we dress up, which I guess would be Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah. Or I guess Saturday. I don't know. When is Halloween? Oh, it's next Saturday. So we could actually do like a Saturday dress up. Are you gonna be around next Saturday, Eleanor? I might be. I. You might have a date. No. I no? might go home. My parents are hosting a 
like person version of Clue, like life size oh. Clue. Oh, that's those are fun. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. If I'm going in the evening or Friday night. I don't know when I'm going. Those are those are cool. They like the box games or whatever that. Yeah. There's another diatom that's landed on its edge. And Pacific Pumpkin says either Celia or spines, depending on what it is. See, we can tell that's the last Sisara. Look, it's got its little spine sticking up right there. Um, but we're seeing it in girdle view, another <laughs> one. And Tom Geep, I assure you, it's social distancing safe. Yeah. My clue game. <laughs> Well, it's her family, so, yeah. you know. I'm not sure what this one is. Maybe another Thalassosaira. We've seen a lot of Tintinids, but I still haven't seen very many of the um, Dinoflagellates. So I'm a little disappointed again. Here's another uh, police crime scene. Something going on there. I do have a couple of stubs of this, so we can move Allie over. Is flexing her Spanish. She said con gold. <laughs> She's been, uh, she probably looked it up, you know. <laughs> it just means with gold. <laughs> She probably looked it up, though. I think gold is different in Spanish. I can't remember. Wouldn't it be something like Oros? Yeah. Yeah. That is a Isthmia, and a little one, relative to the ones that we normally see. Oh, Mallory says to square up. She wants to fight? <laughs> she's a tough talker when she's on the internet. Do we know what this is? Do you have any idea what this is, Pacific Plankton? I'm completely confused by this. Mm -hmm. It looks like it's covered with diatoms. It does look like As uh, she says Cockneys. Is Mia. Is Mia. Oh, is it an internal view of an Ismia? Maybe. Uh I suppose that's possible. Yeah, it it seems like it's covered with diatoms in the same way. That's a really curious internal view. I guess they do have, uh, I guess we'll find out if we look in really closely at one of these holes. Let's go exploring. Freak's chemist says he loves the narrator. <laughs> I don't know, am I the narrator or are you the I, narrator? I don't know. I'm guessing it's probably you. <laughs> well, either way, we love you right back. Uh, Pacific says, enhance. I want to look right in here. And oh, look. sorry. It's Frecht Chemist. Sorry. Oh, Frecht Chemist. Oh, I know sorry. Frecht Chemist. <laughs> Frecht Chemist is a friend of the channel. She's another streamer. You should give her a shout out. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that's an Isthmia. Oh, and gold is Oro in Spanish. Oh, look at me. I didn't take look Spanish. At that. And I did better than Mallory. <laughs> Just if she wants to square up. Tropical Geek's getting on me. He says I need to start reading correctly. We know if you are so good at reading correctly, maybe you should come read. You know? <laughs> Don't be so judgy. Yeah, I think maybe this is uh, one of those pancake... Uh, Oh, he wants to know, did you hire a grad student to read your Twitch messages? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, no, I have an undergrad doing it. The, uh, she's not even hired. She's here yeah, voluntarily. <laughs> she's just here because it's fun, I think. Oh, yeah. Uh, or, I do other stuff, though. Yeah, this isn't justice. her only job. She does also sometimes control the SEM, and uh, she does have her own research that goes on in my lab. Uh, it's just uh, sometimes valuable for me to have somebody read the chat so that I don't have to do it.
and uh... oh, what was that? Let's see, Micah says she's been tricked. Poor thing. <laughs> uh, at no time have I tricked any person. She knew exactly what she was in yeah. for. The uh, the kids in my lab are just high quality. That's all. And then Frex chemist said undergrads don't trust them. I mean, I'm gonna like compare the number of things she spilled in my lab to the number of things you've spilled in your lab, Frecht Chemist, and I'm going to say I trust her a little bit more. <laughs> you know? Like, uh, three out of four times when I've watched your channel, you've spilled something? And then he said she's going to have three in the summer, but now he's just getting one. Oh, Frecht Chemist is a girl. Okay. Her name's Amanda. Oh, okay. Hi. And then Mallory and Tropical Geek are arguing over the word for cooking oil in Spanish right now. It's a, probably a good use of channel time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Here's a little Cirarella hiding in among all the other diatoms in here. <laughs> and then, in fact, Kim, as she says, well, I spent three hours looking at boogers under SEM, so that makes me qualified with SEM. Uh... I think that makes you qualified for lots of things. <laughs> did you put your own boogers under there, or did you look at, like, dog boogers? I'm just curious. <laughs> I, I mean, inquiring minds want to know, where did you get the boogers? I've rotated over to another sample, but it, this is still the unprocessed material for anyone who's curious. Uh, in the TestScan Vega 3, which is the model that I use for scanning electron microscope that I have in my lab, uh, there's seven, a carousel down here in the, in the chamber view uh, with seven samples that we can hold at once. So I can very easily jump from one to the next, uh, which is another one of the characteristics that I liked about this machine. Oh, it's one of, uh, it's one of um, Pacific Plankton's favorite diatoms. It's skeletonema. And then she used her own, of course. She plucked nose hairs. Really? <laughs> really? Yeah. I mean, that explains why you have so many viewers right there. Everybody wants to know what's going on inside your nose. On, oh. on a scanning electron microscope? And she's getting in on the Spanish conversation oh, yeah? here. So this... Uh, this diatom is Skeletonema. It is uh, named such because it has these long, sort of bone-shaped spines. Hey, that... Mallory Sally. We got a new sub. Hey! Woohoo! Thank you for the subscription. Uh, they have these long, bone-shaped spines that sort of knuckle together and um, connect the two valves and then in between so this is a valve face this is a valve face of the sister or sibling diatom and uh, and this is the whole organism right here right so that's one diatom here's the next up to this one and you can see this is mostly girdle band and it's actually broken off the girdle band and this is a bit of the valve face separated from the girdle band so here's the face of the diatom um, we can't see it. It's basically in this long colony. And then it would be attached to its sibling valves. Here's the next diatom, and the next diatom, and the next diatom. So they're living in these long, long chains, and the chains are held together by these, like, bone-shaped spines. And um, I think if we come up to this one, you can actually see the ends of the spines and a bit of the valve face. So the valve face is here. It's got these little pores on it, like most diatom valve faces do. And then the spines are these sort of things that are running around the outside edges here. It would normally be held to the next one. They basically fit together like little knuckles on your hand. And it makes it very hard for the um, colony to become separated. See, and then Mika said, if you don't know how to Photoshop diatoms and give them color, you could always print them out and grab some crayons and then scan them. I think that's a great idea. Um, you know, I could do coloring pages. Uh, I could take like the 
the Astrolopolis that's in the middle of the screen and turn it into a coloring page for people. I think this is a piece of a barnacle right here. Um, just a, one of the little fanny ends to, to their uh, appendages. And I'm just kind of cruising around at the moment trying to see if I can find any dinoflagellates which have managed to escape us again in this image. Here's Astrolompolis. We fought so hard to find Astrolompolis last time, and here's a whole bunch of them. This is the external view again. You can see the sort of bumpy surface on the outside. Oh, uh, and they want you to start selling coloring books and diatoms. I can do kids. that. Yeah, I can do that. Uh, I'll, I'm working on it, you know. I wanted to do the really intricate kind uh, for adults, you know, and then make them so that you could put them on your iPad and color to de-stress yourself. <laughs> because, you know, coloring is a good way to de-stress yourself. See, and Maui contributed a dad joke. She said, be a bit fun, and then electron beam joke. Her jokes are sometimes, <laughs> they fall a little flat. Here's one of these pancakes. I think this is a little pancake dinoflagellate. I don't think that's a diatom. I think that's its little whip. And then Fact Chemist said the SEM technician for her lab wanted to make t-shirts, but she's protesting because it's bad for the environment. T-shirts are bad for the environment? I mean, I'm always down for a free t-shirt. That's true. <laughs> uh, Eleanor does love a free t-shirt. But, uh, you know, I don't advocate for people buying clothes, uh, generally, um, if you have clothes and you can make do with them. But if you have to buy clothes, you should get one with the diatom on it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that just makes sense. I have a diatom shirt on now. You want to showcase your uh, uh, your sure. diatom shirt for your mom? Is your mom yeah. watching? My mom is watching. She bought the shirt specifically so I would wear it during the stream. <laughs> there you go, Eleanor's mom. I don't remember your mom's name off the top of my head. It's I did meet Laura. her. <laughs> Laura? Yep. Thanks for the t-shirt, Laura. <laughs> I think Eleanor is pretty excited about diatoms. Oh, yeah. We've been uh, looking at something that we think might be a new diatom from some of Eleanor's samples. So, kind of excited about that. Super exciting. And I think Eleanor is more excited than me. <laughs> which is, you know, reasonable. But uh, we'll probably be characterizing that, I don't know, sometime this week or next week on the scanning electron microscope. We're still trying to decide what to do for the streams. You know what we should do for next Saturday, if we're going to do a Halloween stream, is um, see if I can find a spider. Mm. And then we could get some spider web. You know, see what the spider web looks like in the scanning electron microscope. Wouldn't that be cool? Can we do anything with the bats? Can we like collab? Do anything with what? The bats here. Oh, we could probably put some bat fur yeah. under the scanning electron microscope. That would be kind of fun. And I don't know any of the bat people anymore. I used to know the, the bat people here in our, on our, in our, our building is the science department on campus. And so the biology department's just upstairs. And um, I used to know the person who did the bat stuff. I mean, I still know her. She's just not here anymore. See, Helsher just joined our diatom army. Oh, thank you for the, for the follow. Some sort of spiky thing over here. Some deflated spiky thing. We, we, need, to, we need a phytoplankton crime scene specialist. See, Dell says that... Dell's here? Yeah, Dell's here. Can we give Dell a shout out? Yes, somebody already did. So okay, we are good. ahead of schedule. Excellent. Like you said there should be a diatom gentleman's club. That's what? That's out there. What? <laughs> what happens at a diatom gentleman's I don't club? Know. <laughs> I'm a little concerned. Everybody probably just gets on microscopes and looks at diatoms. Uh, except for your hosts, which have to have naked eyes. <laughs> Everybody else gets to use a microscope. Like that? Just their eyes are naked, though. 
Ooh, it's a cool little diatom. It's got some junk on it. Uh, the chat is blowing up now. It's hard to keep up. Yeah, Dell does that to chats. <laughs> as soon as he shows up, the thing just takes off. And if Frecht Chemist is still here, I believe she is. She's a chatterbox, so she's probably like, you know, she's probably got the uh, the chat just humming. If you're wondering what's that weird buzzing noise in the background, that's actually the scanning electron microscope's pump. And we have to have a pump running in order to keep the vacuum in the chamber. So if you've used a scanning electron microscope before, you're probably used to that noise. Um, I don't know, I could build a little sound box or something to try to reduce it, but it's sort of a challenge that we can't really get around very easily. So we need a microphone that can pick up our sound, and as a result, it also picks up a bunch of extra sound that we don't necessarily want. Um, but... Um, you get used to it. In, in the scanning electron microscope room, you just kind of get used to the buzzing noise, and uh, and then you don't really hear it anymore. It's a little bit like trains in, uh, in Terre Haute, which is where we live, or where our university is anyway, um, where when I first moved here, there were so many trains, and I couldn't sleep at night because the trains, they honk when they go across the street. Like any streets they cross, they have to blow their train whistle. And so just all the time, train whistle, train whistle, train whistle. See, and Tropical Geek said the FFZ extension includes a sound compressor. Yeah, but then, you know, I'm mean, playing around with a bunch of things I don't necessarily want to be. And then Dell's going to fly over Terre Haute in flight sim. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, I wish there was something exciting to see here from that, but I'm going to guess there isn't. Uh, but you might be able to see my house. <laughs> uh, you probably could see the science building where where we are it has a uh, observatory on the roof so you might be able to crash right into the building you know if you're not paying attention that is at the last Sisyra has one foul face photoportula right in the middle and it uses those to basically create a little chain of these things held together by tiny little thread. So sometimes we'll see them as like a little string of pearls, basically. I'm really disappointed about the fact that I haven't seen any dinoflagellates still, or just that one pancake one. It could be that they're in here and I'm just not recognizing them from their shape. But, uh... Haven't seen, haven't seen. Haven't seen them. Plankton said, "Golden brown pearls." Golden brown pearls. Some more crime scene photos. We've got some sort of organisms here. They, uh, they got, they got taken care of by something. Trouble Geek says, "Imagine if Google Maps took a pic of you guys outside picking stuff." <laughs> outside picking stuff. Yeah, like I guess when we collect stuff for the yeah. stream. Well, it'd be super exciting to see me walk around and collect some stuff from the sides of trees and then not find any water bears in it again. <laughs> uh, you know, I got some material from Pacific Plankton, I should mention, uh, with uh, some tardigrades in it. And as far as I've been able to tell, all the tardigrades I've found have been dead, but or not necessarily dead, but in a uh, sort of torpor state. And um, we have some of them that we just haven't finished prepping them all for the scanning electron microscope. So I think that's going to be something that we do on our Wednesday stream this week. So from 1 to 3 p.m. on Wednesday, we'll probably do that. Uh, we'll probably look at mosses and lichens. And then also um, we'll have actual um, water bears they'll also be a little squished because of the vacuum probably, but um, but we should have them for the scanning electron microscope for our Wednesday feed. So kind of excited to bring that to you. And uh, we've been waiting to put some, uh, some tardigrades on the scanning electron microscope for a while now. And then Frex Chemist wants to know, can you freeze dry the tardigrades? Uh, we do have a freeze dryer. And um, we don't have a frozen stage, 
we don't have a cold stage for the scanning electron microscope itself, but um, but we do have a freeze dryer. Um, do you think that would help keep them from being squished? Because I think that's why you're asking. And then Tropical Geek, we're at Indiana State University. That is where we are. Yeah. Oh look, it's either Gyro Sigma or Pleurocyra. I can't really tell. And it's then some Parks organic said, junk on it. wait, if you freeze dry, they are already dry, so they shouldn't shrink. Mark. Yeah, I don't know. Um, we can give it a try. Um, they, the ones that I have, when I collect them, I put them, um, I just put them on a glass slide with no cover slip, and then uh, they just sort of dried in place. And I think I can just uh, gold coat the entire glass slide and stick it in the microscope. That's mm -hmm. sort of my plan at the moment. Pacific Plankton said to look for the fishnets. Yeah, I can't see them because I think there's organic material. Um, Bass Arpeggio said the sound of your voice plus the vacuum pump equals ASMR. <laughs> Good news, well, everyone. Uh, if you're into it, then I'm happy for you. Uh, you've come <laughs> to the right place because my voice is usually what we hear on the channel, and the pump is usually running when I do streams from the scanning electron microscope. Okay. You should point out I don't always stream from the scanning electron microscope. Sometimes I stream from home on a light microscope, and Eventually, I will try to stream from the lab on a stereo microscope one of these times. Then FUBD has joined our diatom army. All right, thanks for the join. And we're excited to have new followers always. And Tropical Geek doesn't know what ASMR is. Well, it's when people <laughs> like noises, basically, right? There's probably a technical, more technical description than that. But, you know, it's like... Uh, People have a, a sound to their voice, like their whispery voices sometimes they, that make people, you know, they like that, that quality. <laughs> Dirty Smith says, yeah, it gets weird. <laughs> sometimes it gets weird. You know, sometimes Frex Chemist does entire ASMR uh, episodes where she like crinkles papers and, uh, and whispers into the microphone. She puts <laughs> Puts the microphone really close like this and talks. Did that, did that and, get him going? Uh, Dirty Smith says, before you know it, you'll be in a diatom gentleman's club. Yeah, next thing you know, <laughs> it starts with ASMR talking, and the next thing you know. And Bassard Prager says, I'm awake, exclamation point. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good check on whether you're awake when I get close to the microphone. What's this thing? What did we find? Then I have to head out in a, like 10 minutes and go hiking. Oh, you got a date. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. You don't know if it's a date? I don't know if I want to make it any more dates or not. So. Oh. <laughs> We've reached that point, huh? Yeah, yeah. But it's turkey run. It's always fun at turkey run, so. Okay. That's all right. <laughs> oh no, Mallory, no. What's happened? Oh. Uh. <laughs> she said stop and no. <laughs> she doesn't think you should continue dating this person? Everybody's telling me I shouldn't. I need to just not, but uh, he looks like Elon Musk. It's hard. Because that's a positive or a negative? It's a positive. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry, Mallory. You know, he doesn't do weird things like wear fedoras or anything, does he? No, he's just a jerk. Oh. That's a nice view of this Astro Longfellas. It's okay, I'll be able to manage without you. Uh, <laughs> reading the chat at me. I'll just take more pictures. And I've timed it in, a, in such a way that uh, I'll be able to move over to the things that are already processed, which should be a little bit cleaner. So I'm about to do that. <laughs> Mallory says to drop the fedora talk. I never want to talk about it again. Uh, <laughs> if you hadn't brought it up, you know, I probably would have dropped it. 
Okay, Tropical Geek, I'm not leaving science for a jerk. She's going for a hike. Yeah. Yeah, she's got her priorities Good in place. News, everyone. Just happens to be on a hike with a jerk. <laughs> Pacific Plankton said Discord. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, take, take it to Discord. That's a good idea. All right, I'm going to jump over to samples that have been processed. And so they'll have a little bit of a different appearance, hopefully, where everything will be a little bit cleaner and maybe more diatoms per, uh, per field of view. We'll see how well the cleaning that Mallory did on Friday worked out. Look these little curled up things are. Maybe that's a, uh, a dinoflagellate. It's just been uh, squeezed out. All right, I'm going to jump over. We're going to jump over to sample seven, which is in the middle. And uh, one of the things that you should be able to see is that we have a little bit more um, clean material from this to, to look at and to work on, uh, work with. So the diatoms don't have as much junk around them. And you should just see uh, diatoms and some sand particles. Also, the, the image is a little bit darker. This is a, um, a cool diatom. I've been actually... I, just, it's nice that we found this so quickly. This one is Campylodiscus, and one of uh, one of our favorite diatoms. It's uh, sometimes referred to as a Pringle diatom because it's shaped like a little sort of a Pringle chip. And we've seen these in um, Pacific planktons occasionally, and I thought this is what we saw. Um, that is definitely Campylodiscus, like no doubt Campylodiscus. It also it looks delicious. I mean. It's Pringle shaped, so you can you can't just eat one, right? And uh, you know, if Pringles wants to take my stream of a diatom and use it for a commercial, they can feel free to. I give them all all license to do that. All right, uh, so if we're on beam intensity ten. I'm going to drop it down to seven, and what we should hopefully see is the quality of our image is going to be absolutely spectacular. And then I'm going to take a nice picture of it, and I'm going to be able to look at the chat. So um, with uh, Eleanor leaving, what I'll probably do is just take a little bit more picture time, and then I'll be able to bounce over to the chat. And so hopefully um, my uh, people in the chat can keep the chat entertained, even though I won't be able to check it constantly. I'll still be able to catch up with some of it. Anything exciting <laughs> going on in there? Oh, uh, you know, just... Still talking about your date? <laughs> Are we still talking about your date? I, I feel like this sh it's not important. It's just like a side thing. Like, I definitely, I spend more time in the lab than with anybody else. So. But. Science is better than people. Oh, yeah. Definitely. I'm just going to say that outright. It's nice when there's also people, but. See, but Jonathan Gamecast said a Pringle sponsorship would be amazing. I mean, I. I would just point out that uh, the Diatoms Attack logo does have a mustache, like the Pringles mustache guy. Yeah. And um, my daughter really likes Pringles, by the way. So if they would <laughs> like to send us a bunch of Pringles, my recommendation is that they send the regular kind and the salt and vinegar kind. The rest of them, don't really care for. But uh, she'll eat the, the salt and vinegar kind. So that should start an argument about whether or not salt and vinegar is good. Um, so you can really see that sort of shape, the sort of saddle shape that they have, and then this is a really neat view of it. Uh, we just happened to catch one, a uh, nice, perfect, clean valve, uh, just a little bit of schmutz on it, um, but you can really see the structure of the valve very clear. A very complicated organism for only being roughly uh, maybe 100 microns across or something, so relatively um, large for a normal diatom, but kind of um, small for uh, some of the marine diatoms. And then you and Dell buy the same type of Pringles. Well, there you go. <laughs> Good news, everyone. What's the who's who has uh, joined there? Duck in a box. Hey. Duck in a box. I think there's a song like that. Uh, a stick in a box. I think it's like. What'd you say? 
You gotta put the stick in the box. Stick in the box? Yeah. Is it stick in the box, though? I don't know. I'm not very hip. <laughs> <laughs> Stick in the box. I'm pretty sure that's the, uh, I know. Yeah, it's definitely stick in the box. It's definitely that. Okay, uh, let's see. This is drawing our diatom image. Oh, is P-Chops here? Do you know P-Chops? It's good to see you. Uh, I've been warming up the SCM for our underwater lair, and I wanted to let you know that last night, my daughter was playing on Slime Ranchers with me on, uh, uh, on Twitch, and one of the things that you can buy to entertain your slimes that are captive is a purple chicken stuffed animal, and she bought a bunch of them for the saber slimes to keep them entertained. And then she was like, it's like the purple chicken on pea chops. So just letting you know, she's on to you. <laughs> uh oh, Ovi bro wants you to stay. I feel so bad. Yeah, ah. it's okay. Uh, you know, there's only like maybe 45 minutes of the show left anyway. So. Yeah. You were here for the best part. I'm, I'm, ah, oh, this is breaking my heart here. Ah, uh, I gotta go though. Yeah, you gotta okay. hike. Yeah, it's Turkey Run. I'm literally going because I want to go to Turkey Run, not because I like to go. Uh, um, I think on next Sunday, there's a hike, or is it the following Sunday? There's a hike at Shades that I'm running with the Environmental Science Club. Oh, Are yeah? you in that? Are you in the environmental science? I used to be class? in that, and I couldn't balance out of school, so I dropped it. Oh, okay. You mean here? Yeah, I went to the call out meeting. Oh. And then I spend. It's during time. my class, so I can't actually go to the meetings. But uh, the hike is, I think, the next two Sundays from now or something. You can probably still go even if you're not in the club because okay. uh, the club isn't technically going together. Oh, okay. Right? It's like a field trip where we're just meeting there because of COVID. Yeah. Because we're not allowed to travel in a van or anything like that. Oh, I'm always down the hike, though. Okay. I think it's shades, but I'll be doing, like, a... Not just, like, a hike, but also talking about the geology. Oh, so okay. you might actually like yeah. that. Might actually follow what I'm saying. Well, bye, Twitch. <laughs> there you go. Oh. On the bright side, it means I can take my mask off. Okay. So, we got a nice camp play discus. We're off to a great start with the uh, clean slides. Found something cool. Didn't have to do much at all. Hey, there's my face. Cool. Um, let's see what else we can find that looks cool in here. So, some, uh, some of the time when we're looking through the samples, we see these when we're looking at Pacific Plankton samples, we see these things that I, I call cookie stacks, or we call cookie stacks, because sometimes they also look like other things that might be stacked together. And we're always trying to figure out what they are, uh, because sometimes when they're in girdle view, they're hard to tell. And that's what these are, they're in girdle view. Here's a cookie stack in girdle view. And Uh, I clean up the image a little bit for us, and then we can zoom in and look at them on the girdle view, really close. And I'm pretty sure that these are Ellerbeckia. And I've seen a bunch of Ellerbeckia in these samples. Ellerbeckia, the genus, um, have this structure where they're like real poker chips, um, where the valve faces kind of fit together perfectly. And, um, in freshwater settings, other Beckia are usually found news, as aerophytic diatoms, found in, um, in environments where there's limited amounts of water. So growing on tree bark or on the sides of buildings or something like that. Um, you know, we can also look at, which is the isthmia that's right next to it, and get a nice clean view. 
and I can already tell that there's some really nice structure on the pores here that we could get in and look at. Get a nice uh, fix the brightness and contrast so you can actually see what I'm looking at. Um, you can actually kind of get in and look at the individual pores themselves, which is nice. Um, and then I can zoom out and you can get a sense of just how big these things are relative to everything else. So that is a, um, what's impressive to me about these is that is a single celled organism. And uh, the single cell itself in this case is upwards of uh, 300 microns across. So a pretty large cell. And um, we see these all the time in Pacific plankton samples. They just get carried up from the bottom. Um, you can see there's a whole bunch of little round diatoms. And I don't mean to ignore them. I will come back and, uh, and try to see what we can find in there. I'm just trying to get a handle on what's in the samples from this field of view. And we can zoom in and take a look at some of these nice and close. Um, here's that Thalassiosyra. We saw some Thalassiosyra in the other samples. They were standing up on their edge and somewhere on their valve faces. Um, when we have a nice clean view of them and we can get in nice and close, we can actually see a lot of the pore structure itself. So I don't want to do it on one that's sitting on its edge like this, because I think it's maybe going to make it hard for us to get the whole thing into focus in a nice, clean way. But there's plenty of them in our field of view, so we can just go find one and, Good news, and pick everyone. it out. Um, thanks for the follows. Uh, Waba, thank you for your follow. Sorry, it's hard for me to, to do all of it at once. Um, when I'm by myself, which is why I usually have helpers. Well, also because we're doing fun stuff, looking at things in the scanning electron microscope. Oh, it's an it's almost the uh, it's almost the face that we have for Mustachio, one of my icons right there. We've got a diatom for an eye monocle, and this one's gotten smashed in the face, so its other eye is missing. Those aren't actual eyes, just you know, anthropomorphizing again. Uh, here's one of these detilums laying in girdle view. So we get a nice clean shot of the detellum. And as I mentioned, they have these sort of um, eyelash-like spines on them. We can get the eyelash-like spines in really sharp focus. You can see them fringing around the outside of the valve face. Thank you for the follow fox. And, um, and then it has a long spine. So when it's in its life position, usually there's girdle bands that are connecting it in a sort of triangle-shaped prism, and then that spine is attached to the rim of portula on the inside of the diatom. So, uh, there's another ismia. These are all detilums, and most of the diatoms that you're seeing in um, this detilum, detilum, uh, most of these round things that we're seeing are either Thalassiosyra or uh, Cosinodiscus. So if we zoom in and look at this, you'll see that's a Thalassiosyra. Uh, I think we can get a nice, pretty view of the actual pores. So if I can get the focus to come in. Our beam intensity right now is at 10. And um, I'm just going to dump it down to 7 so that the image has even higher resolution. And then we'll zoom in a little bit farther. I just want you to get a sense of what the scanning electron microscope can do. So now we're looking at just these tiny, tiny little structures on here. And I think we could actually take it down even another notch if, we, if we're feeling crazy. But our field of view is currently four microns across. And our scale bar is just one micron. So a thousands of those stacked end to end would make one millimeter on a, on a typical ruler. And if you're joining us late, we're looking at uh, diatoms collected from San Francisco Bay and um, other plankton that are in here as well. But primarily right now we're looking at the diatoms um, just so that you can get a good sense of it. And um, here in the center of the valve, you see there's a 
a little hole that's bigger than the rest of them. Good news, right there. Everyone. That is a rim of Portula. Uh, thank you for the follow, KZ. And uh, the rim of Portula in Thalassia Syra, which is what this genus is, will um, be used to create a connecting point so that the diatoms can live sort of like a string of pearls on a chain together. And this is really pretty. You can see also, sorry, this is the mantle photo portula. The rim of portula is over here. It's a little bit larger and uh, stands out. And this species, uh, the mantle photo portula here, central photo portula is in the middle, and the rim of portula is this big tube sticking off of the vowel face, which is really characteristic of the Lassiosyra. They usually have one big rim of portula that you can see very easily on the valve margin, and often will have one. Um, central photoportula, and then a ring of, or sometimes two rings of um, mantle photoportula, or more commonly a ring of mantle photoportula and a ring of spines. So I think these little pointy things are actually their spines. And the mantle photoportula are these things under here with the little tubes. But it's just slightly dissolved. Um, the other things that we usually are seeing in many, many of these little round things that we're seeing, I think, are Cosinodiscus. Um, we found some Cosinodiscus periphera in here before, and they're really sort of stunning looking. And I'm hoping to get a nice view of one of those as well. I think it's going to be the next thing that I, that I draw. I'm currently in the process of drawing uh, Thalassiosyra, so a different species than the one that I'm showing right there. But um, I do a little bit of drawing from the SEM, I take picture and then basically kind of trace it in a way uh, so that I can make it as accurate as possible. And then that's what's creating this images that you're seeing, the image that you're seeing in the middle of the screen um, next to Pacific Plankton's address. And uh, that is also available if you wanted to buy it on, I don't know, a magnet or something. I'm not really recommending that you spend money, but if you feel like spending some money, uh, and you want to have some cool diatom art. Um, also, I'd like to say that uh, I'm working on trying to put something together for uh, Miss Daisy D has a uh, an art train where they showcase artists on Twitch. So um, this sort of um, cool little uh, train thing that they're working on. You should check out Miss Daisy D. Um, she's, she's a regular streamer here. She streams her art. And um, she sent us some uh, Luna Moths about two weekends ago. We spent a bunch of time looking at Luna Moths that Miss Daisy D had sent us on the scanning electron microscope. And um, so I'm probably going to submit some of my own drawings to the, uh, to the, the art train thing um, and point out that we have a Redbubble site where you can buy stuff. So you can just go to Redbubble and type in diatoms attack and should get drawings that I've made you can browse around and I don't know put it on a clock put it on uh, a telephone case you know they have all kinds of cool things but um, really I just did it because I wanted to have stickers and uh, so I'm probably gonna go to my own website and buy some stickers from my own website because the stickers look kind of cool and I can just stick diatoms on whatever I want then, well, within limits. Okay, so uh, let's see, we've got, I wanna find something cool to take a picture of. Uh, I'm gonna zoom over to one of these other slides and see what's on them. So we're on seven, and I'm gonna jump over to one, and see the stage cam moving, and um, if you've never seen a scanning electron microscope operate before, I'll talk a little bit about how a scanning electron microscope works. So um, the reason that our images are in black and white rather than color is that there's no light inside the scanning electron microscope whatsoever, um, except for a little light that's used, uh, an infrared light that's used to showcase um, what's inside the chamber in the chamber view camera. Here's a uh, cosinodiscus for you. So slightly different than the Thalassiosyra that we're seeing. It's these big um, hexagonal shaped pores and um, it doesn't have the big rim of portula in a very distinct way around the margin. I think this is Cosmodiscus periphera 
um, we can see it has this really beautiful sort of um, areoli. And in this case, the diatom has, I'm going to get that into sharp focus for us, and then maybe we'll take a picture of that. Um, it's like a really cool little pattern. These little openings that you see in between some of the other ones, so the valve face usually has a little sort of uh, grid over top of it of a cribra on the outside, and the cribra is not, is not present on these. You can see it's missing uh, from all of, almost all of them. Let's see if I can find one that still has a cribra on it so you could see it, but I think they're all missing. These ones are just filled with other junk. So this one's probably just a little um, beat up. The, the diatom valve is just a little beat up. And so the cribra is missing. But it actually lets us see that inside the valve, there's a, this, these little holes are called areoli, and there's sort of two layers of silica. And um, these little holes are where the rima portula are for that periphera. They're all over the valve face, which is kind of unique. And then it has some bigger, two other types of rima portula around the margins of them um, on the inside. Can't see them unless you're looking at an internal view. So this is an external view of that diatom. And uh, these little circles that are just laying here on the, on the, um, the stub are girdle bands for other diatoms. So they're just the parts that basically connect them from one diatom to another diatom and allows you to very, uh, we can very easily see them, but they don't have anything special on them in particular. Like there's nothing inside of the, the circle because it's where the, the valve would normally be attached. So I think maybe we have some here where the cribra are still present see if I can tweak the view so we can see them. Maybe they're so fine that we can't really even get a good view of the cribra in this case. But you can see those sort of circles in the background right here. This is a different species, so it doesn't have quite the same shape to it. And I'm not even sure those are the little rim of portulas. Those might be um, valve face photoportula for this species. Here's a nice Astrolophilus. We've been looking at these. That's the thing that's in the middle that I drew a picture of. This is an external view. We've been getting a bunch of external views of it, and I didn't actually have an external view to draw the diatom from. I had only internal views. But we saw some before with really cool, when we zoomed in, we saw they had really cool sort of structure to the, um, to the areoli in here. get those in really sharp focus for us and then we'll zoom out a little bit and we'll just get a picture of these things they normally have um, I think anywhere between three and nine rays so the rays are these radiating components that are coming out of the middle of the valve most of the ones that we've seen from this species which I think is hyalinus uh, Estrolumphalus hyalinus is uh, has had seven and one of the rays is a little different than the other. Um, so these ones, it's, it's asymmetric, right? So you'd have, you could fold it this way, but only, in one, only along this one path in order to have everything match on the opposite side to be mirrored. So I'm just going to slow down that beam. And we've already got the beam intensity set at 7. And I'm going to uh, fix the auto brightness a little bit because it's a little bright in here. And I'm going to take a picture and I'll be able to catch up with the chat. So hopefully something exciting hasn't been happening like terrible or good that I've missed out on. We've seen a lot more of these this time, um, which is kind of nice because they're really cool looking diatom. And as I mentioned, they're not perfect circles, so that's another thing that's kind of neat about them. A lot of the plankton where the diatoms are, they're circular. They're, you know, it's, their shape is very circular. Uh, let's see, I need to come down just a little bit. And maybe just that way a little bit. And speed back to 7. Game intensity set right. Focus is good. And we'll have a nice picture here. So I'm going to move that to that point, and I'll try to catch up with what's been going on.
What's going on? You love how I have no idea what's going on. Yes, math is discovered too. Like the base counting will always be similar. Oh, we're talking about math and philosophy. Oh, that's cool. Uh, what are you saying, gyro sigma? I don't see any gyro sigma. Oh, was it in the little camera? Oh, she's just saying something, I see. You know, it's okay for the channel to just go ahead and have its own chat. Uh, you don't need me. You can watch what I'm doing and I can just be like your background sounds, you know. Boy, there's a big conversation going on. Quarks, leptons, atoms, talking about all kinds of cool things. <laughs> yeah, sorry, uh, Waba. Uh, you can't just go forever. At some point, uh, the scanning electron microscope sort of craps out with our ability to focus. You know, we had this idea um, the other day when we were hanging out, uh, sort of chatting in the Discord. It was like me and Pacific Plankton and Dell were all streamers. We were thinking we should just have like a little panel where we have something going on. You know, like you could be scanning electron microscopes, taking images in the background. Good news, everyone. And uh, hey, Spirit, thanks for the follow. And then, uh, and then we have just like a panel discussion about something like fiction books or uh this is like a nice comfortable like friends who we usually only one of us gets to talk and then we could all talk together kind of a thing so maybe we'll set up something where we do that uh it would be really fun to do like you know maybe not all the time but once a week or um or once every couple of weeks where we have like a you know crossover conversation uh event and then we can have other streamers we can have guest streamers and we can all talk. I think that would be fun. Uh, you know, not that this isn't fun, but a different kind of fun. I kind of th I think it would be a lot of fun. And then we can just have people talk about um, whatever it is they want. If they want to have a conversation about math and philosophy, uh, that's on the table. Everything's on the table, just like casual conversation, you know, and people can feed off of it from the chat you know, we can, we can just basically have it be synthetic, you know, organic. Depending on what we want to do with it. I like it. I think we should do it. And especially, we had like our team, or, team of streamers working together. But <clears throat> really, we could just do it with any group of people that are streamers that might be interested in, in doing it. We can have little panel discussions. I don't know. I think it would be fun. Uh, it would be nice to hear uh, people and have regular conversations with them. So we're looking right down the um, valve face of a detillum. The girdle band's fallen off, the other valve has fallen off, and this one just happened to land in such a way that we're looking right down the valve face. So you get a real good sense of the triangular nature of it. And uh, there's a little bit of schmutz on the valve face. Here's those sort of fringing eyelash-like spines that wrap around the outside margin and you can see this really cool pattern. Let's zoom in and look at that pattern. Uh, you know, I just get nuts sometimes and want to get zoomed in super close and see what's going on. Uh, and inside the pores, these pores, the pores are sort of oval shaped and then they have um, this sort of occlusion over the top. And the occlusion is what's creating that sort of interesting um, you know, like curly cued shape here, uh, like two little C's or something um, that you can see on each side of it. And they're just attached by a little bar on each side. So um, they have different names for different types of occlusions on diatom areoli. And uh, so sometimes they're, 
Vola, and I mean, they just have different names for the types based on whether you know uh, whether they're connected by one piece or whether they're connected by many pieces or a bar. Um, but they're kind of cool. So it's a cool, uh, neat looking diatom, in, especially in the scanning electron microscope. Uh, it's a good look on the inside of something. The internal view. Struggling a little bit to figure out what that is. Uh, maybe some sort of costanodiscus. It's kind of domed. Very dome shaped. Um, and it's hard to see what's going on in there as a result. It's a cookie stack. I'm hoping to find some of the cookie stack ones where we can actually look at the valve face and see the, um, the structure of the sort of spines that hold it together. Um, I saw a nice, yeah, here's a nice actinopticus, and I thought, oh, that's probably going to be a good, that's going to be a good shot. Almost nothing on it. And it's an internal view. So a nice, clean, internal view of it. The pore coverings are missing, so uh, it's slightly dissolved. That's probably a product of it having been a little bit older. It probably was on the bottom of the ocean and got picked up and carried into the plankton, so it probably wasn't living when the sample was collected. I forgot I had my beam intensity set to 10, so nothing ever looks completely in focus at 10. Um, you can see also the girdle bands missing, and the rim of portulas are kind of, uh, kind of uh, beaten up a little bit. So maybe we'll pass on that one and look for a better one. Uh, that's one of the problems with the scanning electron microscope, is you, you know, you search around for things, and then uh, there's never, there's never an end. Like, you know, it's like an endless collection of things you could be looking through. Oh, there's a radiolarian. There's a nice cool radiolarian. Oh, it's charged up like crazy. Um, so not a diatom, but have a silica skeleton, like a little amoeba or something. But these ones are, yeah, like amoeba, they're predators. Um, they're not, uh, they're not, uh, there's another one up here. Um, they're not phytoplankton. Zooplankton. It's a nice internal view of an astrolampolis. We saw the external view. This one has got a little bit of junk on it. Just ruined a perfect, otherwise perfect image. Um, but you can see the, uh, the, the central ray is a little bit longer and skinnier, and then uh, has a different sort of structure than the rest of the diatom. It's really gorgeous. And you can see the, um, the room of Portula on this thing in um, Astrolampolis has these sort of curled shape, and they occur on the ends of each ray, even the long skinny one. And that's the structure that you see on the outside when we were looking at the external view of this thing. So this is just like the drawing that I did, except for it's real life. And uh, I think we could probably get that in a nice, sharp focus for you. And you can actually see, if I autofocus in here, on the outside of the valve, these little pores. You can see those little pores in there. I don't know, the contrast isn't great, but um, maybe if I slow the beam down, you'll be able to see into those little pores and there's little dots inside of them, slightly darker than the gray that's around them. Um, so that's actually looking through the valve to the outside, and this is the, um, the chamber associated with the areoli, and the outside has a cribra, or a covering on it, on the surface, and then there's a second layer of silica here um, on the inside. So kind of a cool, cool look at that diatom. And uh, even though it's got a little bit of junk on the valve face, I'm just going to go ahead and take a picture of it. It's nice. It's nice and sharp. And most of the diatom is free from junk. And I can kind of catch up on whatever philosophical debate's been going on in the channel behind me.
Okay. Cool. <laughs> Funding education is an opposition, yeah. Let's see, there's a lot going on here. Uh, let's see, science communication is difficult and desperate, disparate uh, across various nations and cultures. In the US, we have among the lowest public understanding of science among the developed nations. Yeah, and, uh, and that's part of what I'm doing here, is trying to communicate science in a way that I think everybody could um, easily follow. Um, you know, I could probably fix that issue. Let's see. Nope. Nope. Maybe there? Nope. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think that's a real... Um, a real issue, and part of the reason why I'm on uh, on Twitch, so. Uh, let's see. The U.S. has pioneered open education, and there's a lot of effort from American colleges and organizations to create open courseware. I think that's true. Um, Those pores are pretty neat. Um, I mean, I think part of the problem is that the average person doesn't care about science and they don't want to hear from scientific experts. They'd rather hear information from their neighbor. Um, and their neighbors are relatively uneducated with respect to science. Um, but I think people still want to consume science. They just don't necessarily realize it. Uh, and what I mean by that is people still like to go to national parks. They still like to go to state parks. They like to go out into nature. Um, and I think that they want to have that preserved. They're just not uh, conscious of what the problems that humans can create is. And part of it's based on this, um, uh, this issue that we grew up in a world, or they grew up in a world, where there weren't very many people. And so, you know, they don't really think, and, and by, by and large, people didn't think that humans could really affect vast things like the oceans or, um, or the Amazon rainforest. They just didn't, they don't think of it as a thing that humans could potentially destroy because they grew up in a world where the resources were a lot more abundant. And, um, and they don't, they don't recognize that, um, that the world has changed, right? Because the one thing that group of people largely don't like is the idea of change. But they really don't want to think that the world has become something different than it was, where um, there's just more people and our resources are just more scarce as a result. And, um, you know, as a consequence of that, a, a real consequence of that is that the the environmental crisis that's sort of a pending disaster for us is uh, it's it's brought on by the fact that not just that we are kind of careless about the environment but also that we we have more people than we used to a lot more people and resources are just that much more difficult and when we make pollution we make that much more pollution when we um, you know whatever we're doing we're just actually it's all multiplied and and you know, the older generations who were alive that may not, they may not think about it. Um, not saying that only old people are responsible, but they, you know, I think they're partly responsible because um, they don't think that, you know, driving their car is a big deal. Um, they're not really cognizant of the fact that, that it can create real problems. Hey, here's a cool diatom. Not to get us off of my soapbox. But uh, a nice, neat, ornate diatom. One of these odontella-like things. 
so the whole frustule is here. These are the girdle bands. That's a valve, and that's a valve, and this is the valve face that's basically on the sides. It's laying in girdle view, and it's got a little bit of junk still on it, but I think that's actually a pretty nice view of that diatom. You can see how intricate the, um, the valve faces are, and I'm gonna just fix the brightness and contrast and maybe take a picture of that little guy so it's not so bright. And now I'm gonna ramp up the resolution by slowing down the beam, and then I'm gonna snap a photo. Let's see. Uh, circles are diatoms, yeah, diatom pieces, yeah. That's the most important thing is the scientific method. You can cover it in elementary school and then nothing until college, and if people don't understand what it is uh, or what the implications are, they don't understand how to interpret what science is saying to them. Actually, I think that's a really good point, Tensor Cat. And I like to point out to people when I teach science classes to entry level students that, because um, I'm a professor in my day job, um, that people apply the scientific method without really knowing that they're doing it. Um, what I mean by that is you can, uh, you know, you're, you go to turn on your phone and your phone doesn't work. Um, you don't just go, well, I guess my phone's broken and throw it in the trash. Um, your instinct is to try to figure out why, and you apply the scientific method without even realizing you're doing it. The same thing is true if your computer doesn't work or any time you troubleshoot anything. It's really about applying the scientific method, and um, you know people don't realize that that's what they're doing. But like your first instinct is well, maybe the battery's dead, so I just try to go get the cable and plug in the battery or whatever, right? Um, but anytime you go to troubleshoot something. You start applying the scientific method, and um, I would argue that people like mechanics are essentially just um, applying the scientific method. Their questions are simple ones, you know, like, why isn't this engine working, or why doesn't this toaster work when I hit the button? But the, the mechanism behind it is still the same. The concept for the scientific method is still there, and, um, and I think that that's... Uh, a critical point for people. They, they think of it as being this sort of esoteric idea that somebody out there is applying some, you know, fancy method, but it's actually just deduction and, um, and techniques that everybody uses. We're all scientists um, about some things, right? It's just what, what it is we apply that scientific method to. And I think that's really critical in trying to explain that to the average person that, that you know, science isn't this... Um, I mean, a lot of it is the stuff that happens in labs, but that every person is scientific in a way. Um, they just may not embrace it the way that we do as scientists. Oh, these are cool. You can see the little openings out here on these ends. Okay, so I'm gonna just save this photo and then I'll get back off my soapbox. And for Pacific Plankton, mostly I'm taking pictures for you. Uh, and for me, but uh, any of these that you want, of course, I'll be able to share with you um, after the stream. And I um, haven't taken a lot of photos, but we'll come back to the um, sample and probably take some more later, either on screen or off screen. Um, I've got a little bit of extra time this coming week. Uh, my classes are getting a little bit easier for me to handle. As we get towards the end of the semester, um, we're going to be completely over by Thanksgiving, basically, and be completely online at that point. So, um, and I won't have much to do in any of my classes from that point forward. This is a really cool looking thing. Uh, I want to say silica flagellate, but I'm not completely convinced that's what it is. I don't know. Maybe uh, Pacific Plankton knows. It's really interesting. Not sure what that is. 
definitely made out of silica. And here's a cookie stack. Let's see if this is a piece of the cookie stack or something else. Oh, it is, but it's facing the wrong way for us to see the valve face. Oh, maybe it's at the last Isaira. I think all those cookie stacks are definitely Ellerbeckia anyway, but I would like to see some Ellerbeckia in valve view. It's another sponge spicule. Some uh, Costinodiscus. Uh, one of the things about samples like this is just, you know, there's a ton of diversity, even in the diatoms, and um, sometimes challenging to know what it is that we're looking at. Um, but also it means there's a lot of fun stuff if I just look hard enough through the samples that will become apparent as we browse around in here. That's a Isthmia. This is Actinocyclus right here. And that is a Thlesisira. And that's Ellerbeckia. And that's a Thalassiosira, I think. I'm getting pretty good at my um, marine round diatoms. Uh, not bad for only working on this for a couple of months. And with really no reference material other than uh, the samples that we're looking at and occasionally my friend Anna to help me figure out what something good is. News, everyone. Uh, got a new follow. Hey, GeoBliz, thank you for the follow. Welcome in. Uh, we're looking at some material from San Francisco Bay, as I've mentioned, and I'm mostly looking right now at the diatom part. Um, this is, earlier we were looking at unprocessed material, but this is actually the processed material. And so all the organic, the stinky stuff has basically been removed. And uh, we're looking at the, the non-stinky bits the diatoms and their skeletons in particular. Um, Good news, everyone. Oh, and the follow. Thank you for the follow. My mom born me pro. Well, I mean, I think that's pretty cool. You came out pro. Um, that sounds like a good time. Uh, getting paid to do whatever it is you were doing as a baby. So, uh, yeah, a bunch of diatoms, and most of the ones that we're looking at just falling into like four genera or five genera, mostly. That's, I think that's the Lassiosyra, and it's an internal view. Yep, uh, and there is our Rimaporchula. So we've been looking at them, and there's this sort of long tube that sticks out, and I told you that it's associated inside with a process. Um, and then there's these rings of mantle photoporchula and valve face photoportula on this Thalassiosyra. If we look really close at these, um, you can see why they call it a labia process. It looks like a set of lips, right, in here. And, um, and then these little uh, pores that you're seeing in the background um, with the, um, the uh, sort of lighter circles are um, strutted processes or mantle photoportula. And um, if I have the focus super good, which I don't right now, um, then these things that you can see will stand out with a bunch of little holes on the surface of them. This is the Kerbera on the inside. And part of the problem is the beam intensity is set at 10. If I dump it down to seven and we look you can start to see those holes a little bit better and I'm going to just spend a little bit of time trying to tweak my stigmation Good news, everyone. and get those just a little cleaner and this is uh, whatever whenever I get an opportunity to do this or I can just tweak it a little bit and get the focus perfect, um, I will usually take it. So if we want that to be even cleaner, we're gonna have to drop it down to five. 
um, see our beam intensity because our magnification right now is 113,000 times. So we are super zoomed in. And I'm gonna just zoom out a little bit and we'll have all of those elements that we can see together for our thalassocyra. Let's move a little bit more that way. And so we can see all the manophotoportal at the same time and the, um, the labia process. And then I'm gonna slow the beam down. So hopefully we can really start to see the little holes um, on the valve face, the coverings of this thalassus syro. Um, you can see them in here now, I think, very clearly, but I'm gonna auto um, brighten try to make it as close to perfect as we can get. And then I'm gonna snap a picture of this one and I think I'm gonna take a nice high res, very um, slow beam, uh, speed eight. And while that's running, I can check the chat and I might need to run and get something to drink because my throat's starting to hurt from talking. Despite talking at a low volume, uh, talking for as long as I have is Kind of challenging. All right, so I slowed the beam down to eight, and um, that will actually improve the resolution of our picture a little bit. And we got about maybe um, five minutes after this photo completes, and then I'm going to end the stream, uh, largely because uh, my wife needs to do some shopping and uh, if I don't come home soon she won't be able to get it done so um, oh, there's fun stuff going on in the channel let's see tropical came back welcome back tropical and uh, mint uh, asked the question how do you process samples to remove organic matter um, do we filter them or use a centrifuge and it looks like maybe my lab assistant um, Mallory, who's in here as ISU Igor, has answered the question for us. Um, we don't usually filter, although sometimes I think we probably could to get rid of some of the clay or really fine material. Um, in marine samples, oftentimes they do filter the material. Uh, let's see. If you like what you're seeing, yeah, you should definitely check out uh, Dell Maximum. So uh, he doesn't scan from his, he doesn't uh, do his uh, streams from a scanning electron microscope. This is the only place on uh, on Twitch where you can reliably catch scanning electron microscope activity. And uh, and I promise you, I will never put my boogers in the scanning electron microscope like Frecht Chemist does. Uh, but um, you could check out Dell, and he usually streams live. Uh, freshwater material for the most part from uh, uh, a light microscope and also um, Pacific Plankton who is being perpetually advertised in the middle of the channel uh, in the middle of the stream here uh, as these are samples that she collected and sent to me uh, and um, so you could definitely check her out she will be streaming again on Monday at um, around mid midnight or one o'clock um, in the evening, um, in the morning rather, the next, I guess it's technically for us the next day, uh, but Monday on Pacific time, I think at 10 or 9 o'clock, and Thursdays also at 10 or 9 o'clock Pacific time. Uh, also in that list is A Tiny World. A Tiny World does microscope streaming um, from freshwater material, and, uh, and she usually uh, does her streams on Tuesday, and uh, to fit in with that, Dells are usually like um, let's see, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday, I think, are, are normally the days that Dell does streams. And OpenSet's sort of like a roving uh, maniac, he streams whenever he likes, and uh, also streams from freshwater material um, and plays synthesizers at the same time. So that's my microscope squad of people who stream regularly that, we, um, that are here on Twitch that you can check out. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to catch up, There's so much stuff going on. Um, it's really hard for me to keep track of everything that goes on in the channel at the same time. Uh, Sarah Dance Painter, hello, welcome back. 
Sarah says, can you see DNA or RNA at this magnification? And um, it's a little too small, and also it's organic material. So uh, in a vacuum, it usually would get destroyed. Uh, I think you need a TEM to see that sort of stuff. And even with that, the, the DNA and RNA are a little too small for, uh, for what normally can be captured on those. I'm trying to read. Yeah, they use a x-ray crystallography, or you can, I think they can use a, a TEM um, if you are just looking um, through the material. <laughs> Let's see. Uh... Are we arguing who's better, BTS or the Beatles? Because I think people will forget BTS in like two decades, but I think the Beatles will still be around. Um, songwriting is a little bit more important than, you know, how well you can dance. But uh, TEM is transmission electron microscope. <laughs> uh, this is a pretty neat picture. So one thing that's nice about this is that uh, we're looking at it around 66,000 times. And so you get a really nice clean view of some of the structures on the inside of this Thalassia syra. Diatom lips, yeah, it's like a little mouth. If only we could like edit it so it could do the talking instead of me. And, uh, and then you could just look at that little trumpet shaped thing talking the entire time. The Beatles were okay, yeah. I'm going to argue that without the Beatles, BTS wouldn't exist. So, I mean, at all. They, they wouldn't even be around. Let's see. You can use other techniques to see chromosomes, yeah. Thanks, uh, Jonathan. Uh, the right eyeball is much higher, it's odd. Which eyeball? Uh, let's see. Music taste is relative. It's not about music taste. It's about music writing. Um, you know, it's hard to write music. And for a band that was only together for, you know, basically 10 years, the Beatles are pretty amazing in the number of songs that they wrote and the foundation for all rock and roll that came after them. So you need to think about it not in terms of like, applying modern concepts for music to ancient concepts because it doesn't make any sense like that. Uh, the Beatles were revolutionary in terms of what they, they've made and played for music. Oh, oh, the eyeballs above the lips. Oh yeah, oh, I guess it does make a little face. Yeah. Burp, 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 burp. Uh, it's probably its old man face, you know? When I was a kid, we didn't have BTS. You had the Beatles and you liked it. Like that? Uh... <laughs> yeah, you can keep the conversation going on Discord if you like. I have a Discord channel and um, so does Dell and so does uh, Pacific Plankton. And we all hang out on each other's Discord channels. So uh, uh, there's a good way if you wanted to chit chat with any of the people in here, you could hop on over to Discord. And I promise that uh, we don't bite for the most part. And sometimes I actually will stream from my light microscope or so does uh, Dell and Pacific Plankton into the voice channel. And sometimes we just hang out in there and, uh, and chit chat. So you could hang out with us and chit chat about, you know, philosophical math conversations, if that's your thing. Casual science and life. Yeah, that's what we're in for right now. I don't agree. Well, um, I'm just gonna tell you that I've been listening to music for a lot longer than you, and you sometimes get your music from me, so I kind of know a little bit more about music than you but 
Uh, you go on with your bad self, Mallory. Let's see, what do you recommend for a light microscope for streaming? Um, any light microscope that has a trinocular port would probably be relatively good enough uh, to stream from. It's about having a camera and, uh, and having some, um, you know, decent lenses, but even even the the lowest quality microscopes, the relatively low mo uh, quality microscopes, have good enough lenses on them that if you're streaming at stuff that's like um, in the 20x to 4x category, you probably can get some pretty good images out of them. Um, we had a conversation about uh, uh, microscope light microscopes that you might buy with some. Um, with another uh, streamer, Fizaria, who's thinking about buying a light microscope on Pacific Plankton's Discord channel. And we gave some recommendations and we all sort of chatted with her about it. So that's one thing that you could do is go check out that. Um, it depends on whether you have a DSLR camera or whether you want to use a camera that comes, um, you know, separate that you can put in an eye port or put into um, the, the uh, trinocular top mount for a camera. So, um, So that was a long time for just the one view, but I'm kind of excited about that shot, actually. So I'm going to ramp up this speed and change the beam intensity back to 10. And I'm going to find one more thing to try to image before we call it a day. Because, um, you know, I do have responsibilities at home and uh, can't play on the SEM all day like we normally do. Um, as a result, and um, slowly start to uh, close down the stream for today, but um, we'll be back on Wednesday with some, I believe, with some tardigrades, so if you're interested in seeing that, and I might actually sneak in another stream sometime this week where I just uh, am looking through some more of these plankton samples because there's a lot of really great um, stuff in this sample and, um, and these clean samples look really sharp to me. So there's some things in here that I'd like to sort of explore and get some really clear shots of. So, um, and I'm sure that, that uh, if I'm going to draw some more things for the red bubble site and for the upcoming train thing that I might need a few more shots of some of these diatoms uh, to do that. So and I'm making extra work for myself by um, uh, finding things for me to draw, but uh, it's, it's, it's a good thing to do in my spare time to sort of de-stress from uh, all the work that I do normally. So. Um, I um, want to say thank you to Eleanor for when uh, she was here for the first half of the stream for coming in on Saturday when she could have been doing anything else and she doesn't get paid to be here and hang out with us. Uh, she did a great job of handling the chat for the first part and um, all of my lab assistants, including uh, Mallory, who for some reason thinks that BTS is better than the Beatles, like, you know, uh, is here helping um, manage the chat on a weekend, um, not getting paid to do it, and always appreciated. So, hey, look what I found. It's not Gyro Sigma, it's Pleuro Sigma. And I know that because the pores are decussate. And that's a nice pretty one with not a lot of junk on it. So I'm just gonna rotate it around. Um, one of the things I haven't been doing is turning the SEM so that um, you know I can spin it around so that uh, things are at a different angle. Um, while I was taking photos, I hadn't really had a whole lot of reason to do that before this, but, um, but now I do. Oh, I went the wrong way. 240 maybe. Good news, everyone. Hey, we got a new follow. Let's say 245. 
I'm just going to keep spinning it until I get it mostly in the right angle that I want, which is this one. And the reason I want that to be at that angle is so that I can maximize across the uh, field of view. And I still need to go in and check the focus, because if I tried to leave it where it was, it wasn't completely focused on it. And there's the focus I want. We can see that this is a diatom with a raphe. The raphe runs down the middle of the valve. And for benthic diatoms, or diatoms that live on the bottom of the ocean, that's actually how they crawl around and reposition themselves. And things like Pleurosigma, they like to live on muddy surfaces. So um, not only do we know that they don't live in the plankton normally, but we also know the kind of environment that they usually live in. Um, a very cool looking uh, S shape to them or sigmoid shape to the diatom and um, closely related to another diatom that has a similar shape called uh, gyrosigma. So gyrosigma and pleurosigma are differentiated by whether or not the uh, areoli are shaped in a diamond shaped or, uh, or whether they are shaped in a uh, sort of a cross shaped. So a nice clean image. Not a lot of junk on it. And uh, this is one of Pacific Plankton's favorite diatoms. So it's like I planned it for the last one, but I didn't. Uh, and I'm excited that we got a nice clean shot of it though. So once this brightness contrast gets finished, I'm going to take a picture and then um, I'll let that sort of play us out. We need to figure out who we're going to raid. So uh, if you have ideas for that, you can start posting those into the channel right now. And um, I'm just going to go ahead and hit the photo capture. So as it's building that, and I will check back with the channel. Let's see. Uh, this is Pluro Sigma. And, uh, oh, Rocket Sage. Uh, we could go visit Rocket Sage. Uh, Javasaurus, yeah. Um, those are all good people. Can we raid Sky X High? Sure. Uh, I don't really care who we raid. We've raided Javasaurus before, and we've also raided uh, Rocket Sage before. And, um, you know, so I like to catch somebody new. I like to sort of branch out. She plays Apex. Is she playing right now, Dangling Uvula? Is that what's going on? Okay, let's go ahead and raid them. Um, you know, we can take our crowd over there and see what's going on with their crowd. That'd be great. Uh, one of our favorite parts, one of the favorite things that we like to do is end with a little raid. Apex Legend is a video game. It's a video game? Okay. That's all right. So let's see. And then backslash raid. And then we'll spam them with some diatoms in, in our raid. Uh, it's been great having everybody here today with us. Thank you for chatting and for, for hanging out with us as we sort of explore these samples. And I also want to thank again uh, Pacific Plankton for rushing these samples off to us. So, Good news, everyone! Um, thanks for the follow there, Headless. And um, you can check her stream out, or you can check our stream out. Um, uh, and also, you can always uh, check in with us on our Discord as well. You should do all those things. Uh, definitely check out Pacific Plankton. You will enjoy it. Uh, and, and she's got a great stream that she does with really great uh, visuals of these things as they're living. We're looking at the dead parts, but she looks at the living parts. Okay, so let's see. I set it up. We're ready to go. We're accumulating our viewers, and um, and we'll, we'll end in the raid. All right, so thanks, everybody, and um, we'll, we'll catch you next time.